Um, okay, so what I'm going to be doing today is doing the same as I've done before. I'll take you through the life of Freud, and then we'll go on to discuss some aspects of what he actually wrote about. Now, those of you that were here last week will remember that, oh, yes, last week, when we talked about Marx, I was trying to say that we can look at Judaism through Marxist eyes, because he, Judaism is saying a lot about Tikkun Olam, about society, and arguably it's a Marxist view of it. Um, so that's society as a whole. Judaism also says a lot about individuals, and I'm going to look at Judaism through Freud's eyes, and I'm going to be arguing that, he, like Marx, he, he didn't know much about Judaism on the surface, but my goodness, was he influenced by it. So I think we should all be Freudians at the end of today. Okay, so, and as I'm going through, please do interrupt with questions. Just unmute yourself if you so wish and come in and say something, as I think that'll be, be good to have that discussion. Okay, so let me uh, start off with uh, maybe moving this on. Let's see if that's, maybe I need to click it. That's it, great. So I'm going to start off with a summary of who he was like. And I think there's four key things, really, which you need to know about him. He was definitely a radical. He was the father of this completely new profession. Who, who else can say that, really, that he started something from scratch? He made an unparalleled contribution to the understanding of human psychology and to mental disturbance and to child development and to mental health and sexuality, and of course, psychoanalysis as well. Um, he was an outsider. He was heroic and creative, a man who defined himself and pursued truth against the constraints of tradition. So no one wanted him to do this. In fact, he was put on one side for many years because of it. Um, and I think probably his outside status as a Jew in that time in Vienna, when the uh, early 20th century, really helped him to be a radical thinker. He said the same himself as well. Much of his work has been discredited, however. He tended to choose the facts that supported his theories, and he made sweeping generalizations, not all of which have subsequently held up. And he was secular. He, he was typical of many Western Jews. He was estranged from religious Judaism. He wasn't a Zionist. In fact, he described himself as an absolutely irreligious Jew, a godless Jew. He was ignorant of Judaism, frankly, and he felt he wouldn't succeed if he were religious. He saw Judaism as mired in superstition. But having said all that, he remained faithful to his Jewish identity. He didn't convert. And despite all these protestations, as you will see, I think there's a lot of Judaism in what he, he talked about. So let's go back to the beginning. He was born in Freiburg, which is in Moravia, now, now Czech, on the 6th of May, 1856. And his father, Jakob, unsuccessful wool merchant from a Hasidic family. His relationships with his father are going to be so important in determining who he was, and I'll explore that a bit later. His mother, Amalia, uh, she was Jacob's either second or third wife, 20 years younger than her husband, age 21, when Sigismund, or Sigmund as we know him, was born. He was always her favorite child. She called him my golden Siggy. Um, and uh, this is a, that's a picture of him aged uh, 16. Um, now, he was the um, oldest of eight children. He had five sisters, three brothers, uh, including one who died in infancy. He also had two much older half-brothers who migrated to Manchester, actually, in 1859. That was from his father's first marriage. Mm. After Jacob's business collapsed in 1860, the family went to Leipzig for a year and then to Vienna, where Freud changed his name to Sigmund. 
And he lived in Vienna for the next 79 years until 1938. Uh, Jacob, the father, ceased all Jewish observance after they moved to Vienna. And uh, Freud never studied Judaism. Um, instead, he had an enlightenment education, and with his precocious talent, came top in his class for six successive years. He maintained this passion for learning and knowledge throughout his life. His family had high expectations of him. They felt his destiny, and he felt his destiny, was to make an impact on the world. He was going to be a special person. So he went to secondary school a year early, and his studies dominated the house. So he ate separately from the rest of his siblings. In fact, his sister Anna's piano was removed from their apartment because the sound of her practicing disturbed him. Um, he had his own room the rest of the siblings had to share. So this is actually a picture of the family in 1876. So you've got standing, you've got Paula, Anna, uh, Sigmund, third from the left, and, and the rest of them. Um, in 1873, he enrolled in Vienna University as a medical student. He initially considered studying law. Now, 25% of the students at this uh, university were Jewish, even though Jews only made up about 9% of the city's population. And perhaps because of that imbalance, uh, it was here that he first encountered anti-Semitism. They had to defend themselves and all, all live in isolation. Freud was scandalized by this, and he wrote, a civilization which leaves so large a number of its participants unsatisfied and drives them into revolt neither has nor deserves the prospect of a lasting existence. Um, he conducted research on physiology from 1876 under Ernst Brücker, a uh, picture of Ernest there, and he eventually graduated as a medical doctor in 1881. Now, Brücker believed that all vital processes could be explained scientifically. So, eliminating religious ideas about biology. Um, so, that is effectively the, the, a God-created God man and so forth. Freud also believed building upon that, that cause and effect determines thoughts and feelings and fantasies. So very much in the rational camp. Now that would bring dis considerable discredit to psychoanalysis. It's not a science. You can't create the formula. Um, its hypotheses are often retrospective and can't be used for prediction. Um, in 1882, he became engaged to Martha Bernays. He, he, they fell in love when they first met. And she was the only woman that he ever loved. She was five years younger than he, and her grandfather had been chief rabbi of Hamburg. And two of her uncles were renowned intellectuals, the sort of life that Freud himself wanted to live. Uh, and his brother, Ellie, married Freud's eldest sister, Anna, in 1883. He entered clinical practice in 82 at the Vienna General Hospital, and he pursued neurological research. And then in 1885, he went to Paris on a government uh, fellowship and worked at this uh, mental hospital, the Salle Petrier, under the neurologist Jean Monta Martin Charcot. And they, he was researching hypnosis. And it was this guy, Charcot, who had the greatest professional influence on Freud. In fact, he named his first son, Martin, after him. He hung his portrait in his study and kept it there even after much of Charcot's work had been discredited, and the discrediting was done by Freud himself. Um, in 1886, he, after a four-year engagement, he married Martha. They had both a civil and a religious ceremony. Um, the, the religious only at Martha's insistence. He didn't want that at all. 
and tried it hard to influence her to become secular, in fact, an atheist. And eventually, she, he succeeded in that. Um, so between 1891 and 1938, they lived at uh, Bergasa in Vienna. And they had six children in eight years, which is quite some going between 1887 and 1895. After that, they, they gave up sex, actually. Um, I think she has some say in this. Um, he was very proud to have so many children. So this is the family in 1898. So in the front row, you've got Sophie and Anna and Ernst. In the middle row, Oliver and Marta. And then uh, the um, Amina Bernays, who is uh, the sister-in-law, I think. And the back row, you've got Martin and Sigmund. Um, so he attached great importance to his marriage. They wrote over 1,600 letters to each other over their lifetime. They seem a love match, really. Martha was independent, intelligent, and uh, cultured. So they stayed married for 53 years until Freud died. And after his death, she wrote to a friend um, yep, how terribly difficult it is to have to do without him, to continue to live without so much kindness and wisdom beside one. It is small comfort for me to know that in the 53 years of our married life, not one angry word fell between us, and that I always sought as much as possible to remove from his path the misery of everyday life. So perhaps a bit of rose-tinted glasses there, but nonetheless, um, a good marriage. Now, needing a source of income to support Martha, he reluctantly gave up his research and started practicing medicine. Um, and in 1886, he resigned from the hospital and went into private practice specializing in nervous disorders. So you can see, oh, we just lost it. But this is a picture of the room. I don't know whether people online can see this. We've lost it in the room, so I won't talk about it. But it's a picture of his, there we go, picture of his study with all sorts of ornaments and clutter and books. Um, he, he was a, a collector of many different sorts of things, um, a really fertile mind. Um, he adopted at this point Joseph Breuer's approach to hypnosis, and Breuer became Freud's sponsor, lending him money and referring patients to him. Breuer's most renowned patient, anyone know what she was called? You might have heard of her. Anna O. Anna O, that's right. And the pseudonym of Bertha Pappenheim. She was an Austrian Jewish feminist, um, and at times she had severe symptoms. So she only spoke in English, for example. She had partial paralysis. She heard voices. Split personality syndrome, we'd probably call it today. Breuer famously reduced the severity of her hysterical, in inverted commas, symptoms as she retrieved memories of traumatic incidents under hypnosis. And in 18, 1895, Freud published with Breuer this book, Studies in Hysteria, which set out for the first time the idea that emotions from unresolved traumatic experiences were repressed or hidden away in the unconscious mind. Freud believed that nothing that people do is accidental and that the unconscious has a crucial role in determining behavior, even to the extent of producing effects that are in opposition to the conscious will. So there's always a goal underlying a person's behavior, and highlighting that often unlocks and explains why the behavior was chosen. Now, Freud wasn't very effective at hypnotizing his patients. So he dropped the, this approach in favor of a new therapeutic um, technique, which he called free association. And he asked the patients to abandon themselves and say whatever came to mind. So this may, marked a radical change in the role of the doctor at the time. It's, it's kind of usually normal nowadays. We take it for granted. Mm. 
but in hypnosis, the doctor's in control. And when you go and see a doctor about a physical ailment, they determine what, what goes on, really. But in free association, the patient's in control. So that helps the patient get greater insight into themselves. It led to modern counseling, to modern approaches to management, to listening and facilitating as opposed to command and control. It's, so we just take it as granted these days, but it was really radical, this start that he did. Um, aged about 40, he had a crisis himself. He saw himself from a kid as being this world-changing person, and he'd achieved relatively little. His professional ambitions were thwarted. He wasn't gaining the public esteem he craved. He was struggling financially as he lost patience. Uh, patience as in people that come from not, not the sea with a TS. And, and he was tormented uh, at self-doubt because he wasn't really curing them as such. At times, he actually blamed his patients for rejecting solutions, his own solutions to their problem. Um, he worried he was being seen as a charlatan. Now, in 1896, his father died. He was aged 81. And that provoked Freud to do his own self-analysis. And he focused on his dreams. Um, he imagined himself to be Moses, about to enter the promised land. Wow, that's an interesting dream, isn't it? So he saw himself really as the spiritual leader of humanity, the creator of a new psychological law um, about to expel from the land the backward Philistines with their false gods and superstitions. So he explored his feelings of hostility towards his father and concluded that he had an unconscious desire to renounce his Jewish father. He was a failed merchant, um, and he held his father responsible for these taints, for his poverty, social humiliation. Freud's history, I've, I've taken you through some of the men that influenced him. He seemed to go from man to man, wanting a substitute father, someone that he could look up to and really respect, and he never found him. He broke up with all these people, ended up rowing with them, so ended up estranged and disillusioned from all these substitute father figures, really. He also explored his feelings of jealousy over his mother's affections for his father. And so that led him to create his um, theory of the origin of neuroses. So originally it had been that he thought that fathers had wanted to seduce their daughters, but now he said, no, it's children who've got unresolved issues with their parents and the way that they're brought up. And that probably is much, well, certainly much more akin to how modern psychologists would see things. So in 1899, he, he published The Interpretation of Dreams, which came out of his own self-analysis, really. And this is the idea that he himself was most proud of in forming his legacy. He saw dreams as wish fulfillments or repressed infantile desires. They were often repellent and had been censored. But he said, the interpretation of dreams is the royal road to a knowledge of the unconscious activities of the mind. Very pleased to be appointed associate professor, professor at the University of Vienna in 1902. He had a fair bit of anti-Semitism to overcome, but also his theories were so way out and radical, they just thought he was a bit crazy. Um, so he, had strugg he struggled to get these appointments. Uh, and then that year, he also started his Wednesday evening discussion group, which was a small group of five Jewish followers who met in his apartment to discuss matters of psychology. And it was interesting that all the founders of psychology were Jewish. Mm. Um, maybe, arguably, it appeals to Jews because it's a way of explaining alienation, which we talked about last time with Marx, and guilt. Um, the guilt which many Jews had felt since the ghetto walls came down and uh, they tried to assimilate, they were giving up their Judaism, their assimilation into secular society was being blocked because of anti-Semitism. Uh, so uh, real issues that they had. Um, 
the basic discoveries of psychoanalysis were also rooted in Kabbalah, which Freud knew about. The interpretation of dreams, there's, there's, the session, there's sections in the Talmud, which is about this as well. And he and Freud later would say that it really helped that he was Jewish for him to establish this because he was a free thinker. He wasn't constrained by being part of the establishment, particularly the Catholic establishment, which is so important then. So these Wednesday evening groups were the start of the worldwide psychoanalytic movement. And Max Graf joined the group in its early days. And he wrote uh, an article describing its meeting as follows. So the gatherings followed a def definite ritual. First one, the members would present a paper. Then black coffee and cakes were served. Cigars, cigarettes on the table. And they were consumed in great quantities. After a social quarter of an hour, the discussion would begin, and the last and decisive word was always spoken by Freud himself. There was the atmosphere of the foundation of a religion in the room. Freud himself was its new prophet, who made the previous prevailing methods of psychological investigation appear superficial. So clearly, it really must have been a very exciting time, very stimulating. Start something completely new. Now, Freud focused on the importance of sex in determining personality. And he published this book, The Three Essays on the Theory of Sex, in 1905, same year that Einstein did his discoveries. Another one we could do at some point. In his view, repressed impulses were frequently sexual drives, which the patient had resisted and had gratified with substitutes. Now, these controversial sexual theories were completely unacceptable to the medical profession, and he was virtually ostracized by them for a decade. In retrospect, they gave people permission to be different and to talk about sex. So his work, there's a direct line, you can link it to commercial advertising, mm. for example, that appeals to subconscious desires. Mm. He normalized talking about emotional complexities, open the doors to organizations such as Childline or reality TV. He's just broken down so many of the barriers, really. In 1906, he met his new male role model, Carl Jung, Jung excuse me. And, and Jung became his foremost pupil initially. They worked together until 1914 when Jung set forth his own theories, which repudiated Freud's infantile sexuality. Uh, the first meeting of the International Psychoanalytical Con Congress was held in Salzburg. And then we get into N N World War I, when his sons were both active in it. They both served. They survived, but their experience led him to realize that shell shock was an emotional as well as a physical issue. We'd now call that PTSD, I think. And then tragically, in 1919, his favorite daughter, Sophie, she died of influenza. She was only 26. The family struggled financially. After the war, he lost a lot of money when the value of Austrian state bonds collapsed. He was one of the first governors of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And his ideas developed um, whilst emphasizing instinctive biological needs in child development. He also saw parents placing constraints on the gratification of these instincts. And it's the conflict between instincts and the demands of parents and society, which is the basis of personality development. And here are an interesting couple of quotes from him about this. So most people do not really want freedom because freedom involves responsibility. And most people are frightened of responsibility. So they prefer the structure maybe of an orthodox religion as opposed to taking responsibility with the freedom of a progressive re responsibility. There was Viktor Frankl, the um, famous psychologist who later on said, there is a Statue of Liberty off the east coast of America, 
there should be a statue of responsibility off the west coast they they kind of go hand in hand and this other quote being entirely honest with oneself is a good exercise whether it's possible to be entirely honest i don't know mm. it does how does one know if i'm being honest or mm. putting up barriers but really provocative interesting things he would say he worked closely with his daughter anna who was also a psychologist um, and alongside melanie klein she's considered the founder of psychoanalytical child psychology when the Nazis came to power in January 33, they burnt his books, as well as many others, of course. He, he naively believed that his worldwide fame would mean that he wouldn't personally be affected by the rise of Nazism. And he sarcastically commented, what pro progress we're making. In the Middle Ages, they would have burned me. Now they're content with burning my books. Well, he was speaking a bit too early, obviously. Um, he didn't make much efforts to get himself out but with the intervention of uh, Ernest Jones, who was one of the early psycho, uh, psychoanalysts and was British, and the British government, aged 82, um, him and many of his family were hurried out of Vienna in June 38. Um, his daughter Anna had been detained and interrogated by the Gestapo. But his four elderly sisters, they all died in 1942 in concentration camps. In England, he recreated his Vienna consulting room in Hampstead, not far away. This is now the Freud Museum. It's well worth a visit if you haven't been. Uh, he became ill and was cared for by his daughter, Anna. And he died really by assisted suicide, actually, in London on the 23rd of September, 1939. The diagnosis was cancer of the jaw. Um, he'd started smoking cigars from the age of 24, and he smoked 20 a day. Um, he had over 30 operations on his palate in his last 16 years of his life. He probably should have given up. Uh, but he was in such pain that he, had, he was he just couldn't at the end. So he was cremated um, at Golders Green uh, Crematorium. Um, and that's where his urn is. And Martha died in 1951. And at the time of his death, he was successful, he was famous, he was fated. And in fact, he had lots of well-known descendants, as this sort of family tree makes, makes clear. So he was the grandfather of uh, Lucian Freud, who's the artist, obviously. Clement Freud is also his grandson. He was the what was it, comedian and a cook and an MP. Um, he's the great grandfather of David Freud, who was an, um, a minister of welfare, I think, welfare reform in Cameron's government. Um, and also to uh, the fashion designer, Bella Freud, the journalist, Emma Freud. So a big family there, really. So what was he like as an individual? Well, um, I think the first thing, he was charming. He was dynamic. He was demanding. He was opinionated. He was intensely ambitious. And he attracted a group of enthusiastic followers to spread his ideas. But he didn't allow dissent. He eventually, he quarreled with most of his colleagues. And in fact, he dreamed. Oh, I shouldn't be laughing. He dreamed of killing his family and friends. He was that very similar, I think, to Marx in that way. I think if you are focused on something, mm. you have this attitude. Um, and it was also creative, again, like Marx. He had created the fundamental, indisputable, absolute tenets of a new science in his eyes. And he viewed differences of opinions as personal betrayals. So his changes in view came from his own insights rather than in response to the criticism of others. They were wrong if they criticized. He hadn't been on that management training course, how to take criticism. So I think it's no surprise to say that he had some obsessional traits which drove him. He had a real strong concern for cleanliness and order. He, he had his hair cut daily. Um, he was parsimonious, 
he only ever owned three suits and three pairs of shoes and three sets of underclothes. He, he went around those. Dedicated to his work, he wanted a dominating passion, as he called it, and he couldn't contemplate a, light, a life without it. His strong sense of morals, though, he strongly believed in the importance of education and contributed regularly to the upkeep of some of his poorer students. He valued self-discipline and reproached himself for his indulgent taste, so his tobacco and his books and all those ancient art objects I, said, I, I showed. He censored his own writings so as to keep his private life out of the public arena. And he didn't reveal his own intimate secrets, though he spent a lifetime investigating others. He was aware from an early age of the need to create his own destiny, and he edited his writings with that in mind. And although kind and tolerant as a psychoanalyst, he was pretty cold and impersonal to others. He's more interested in ideas than in relationships. People were things to him, really. So this is a typical cynical quote by him. I have found little that is good about human beings on the whole. In my experience, most of them are trash. No matter whether they publicly subscribe to this or that ethical doctrine or to none at all. That is something that you cannot say aloud or perhaps even think. But that's what he thought. So he was cynical about people. So that's his life. I'm now going to talk about his, what he thought about religion and how we can, why his views are so Jewish, in my view. But are there any questions about his life or him as an individual? Is there got... form of psychology before him? Um, mm, not as a formalized uh, science or, or subject. I'm, arg I'm going to argue there's loads of psychology in the Bible, but we wouldn't call it separate. No, no, you can say he formed it, one of the very few. Hypnosis was done before. It was a technique. Yeah, so that was just, yeah. yeah, but not done very successfully. It was like, and it was done like from, he, he fell into this, this um, trap as well. He did, he basically had a few individual patients and he created vast theories from these individual patients, not a scientific way of doing it, which is why a lot of it has been disproved. But he threw out so many ideas that some have stuck. So nowadays, I think Freud would be looked at by psychologists. He, he wouldn't be authoritative at all, but, the, but he was the source material for lots of ideas. A bit like Judaism, you know, we've got the, the, the Torah, but Judaism has developed so much from there, really. He was very private about his own self-analysis. Yeah. Did, did that come out after his death? Were the papers published or allowed to be read? Because it um, sounds like obsessive compulsive. Yeah, it is definitely. So there were papers, but he had edited them before they they came. So yes, I I think he. We don't know the full truth about him. My gut feeling is that he may he probably wasn't a very he has some really deep dark thoughts, um, which we don't know about really. Um, which is why his wife's quote is a bit odd. It stands, stands mm -hmm. against that. She just paints him as a perfect person. Whether she was told to do that, who knows? She was, she was helping to embellish this image as well, maybe. A lot of these people are like that, really. Told, um, I, I, Engels did it with Marx, as we know. Um, and I said, Jesus, Paul did it with Jesus. I think lots of these people who've become uh, almost iconic ha have had their images massaged to, for other people's benefits, maybe. Mm -hmm. And also, it seems from her quotes that it was about her looking after him. So maybe that's what she was missing, you know. All, all yeah. her, her whole purpose in life was to make sure that he was happy and looked after. So yes. when, the, when the, her object of, obviously, yeah. care was removed, you know, she kind of lost the sense of her life. So it was a little bit different of saying, you know, he was the embellishment of the ethical and moral behavior. It was more about some, someone who gave so much sense of meaning to my life is gone. You're right. That's an open. In, in reality, you could argue that Anna, his daughter, 
actually looked after him much I more know, than his wife, <laughs> wife did. Actually, she got a bit pushed out. There's a lot of analysis that could be done there as well, interestingly. Okay, so now this guy from that last quote there, that's not something that I hope Tanya would say about people because it's not a very religious sort of way of looking at things, is it really? And I think that shows his views about religion. Um, he, um, he, he was clearly opposed to uh, and feared religion, um, especially despising Catholicism, which was the dominant religion in Austria at the time. Mm. He was embarrassed about being Jewish as it typecast him in an unattractive light for an enlightenment intellectual that he saw himself to be. So he was always an atheist. And interestingly, today, religion often sees psychology as a threat to it because it challenges lots of the sacred cows of, of religion. So anyway, here are some quotes by Freud on religion. So first one, the more the fruits of knowledge become accessible to men, the more widespread is the decline of religious belief. So for him, religion is irrational and science and reason will replace it. Um, and dog, what's more, dogmatic religious instruction contributes to a weakness of the intellect. Close down lines of inquiry. Religion is a system of wishful illusions, together with a disavowal of reality, such as we find nowhere else but in a state of blissful, hallucinatory confusion. And religion's 11th commandment is thou shalt not question. <laughs> um, now, actually, that's not Jewish at all. What, mm. <laughs> what all Jews do do is question. question yeah. But what? Obviously, in the Catholicism, I don't think you mm. do. And in some yeah. parts of Judaism, maybe you have to accept a lot on, on, on faith. Um, his main point is people have a need for security. And so they invented a source of forgiveness for them. So God, they, people feel helpless and guilty. They want someone to say, hey, it's OK. We're going to look after you. Like children have parents to protect them. We need, we transfer this onto a replacement parental figure of God. But very similar to Marx's view, by the way. And maybe some psychological truth in all that. Mm. Maybe. Think we can discuss. And where questions of religion are concerned, people are guilty of every possible sort of dishonesty and intellectual misdemeanor. What do you think he was talking about there, or thinking about there? Yeah, so it could well be that. Yep, absolutely. Um, what about theology? Because there'd be things within religion which he thought, this is just nonsense to believe um, this. Yeah. Well, we all make, we, we basically speculate about something we have very little knowledge about. Yeah. Okay, so it could be speculation. Yes, absolutely. Anything in particular you were thinking of? Or? Uh, the concept of God. Okay, so God as a whole. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Could be, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There are probably, yeah, so there's something which just goes against um, uh, Darwinism, doesn't it? And, and evolution. Yeah. Or there are some, maybe he was thinking about a man coming back from the dead as well. Just some completely irrational mm. things which just just are, are, are implausible. Oh, the whole theology about life after death. That's right, yeah. yeah. So from his point of view, also religion doesn't give people the freedom to think for themselves. And so psychoanalysis came out of the desire to free the individual from repression and to find a narrative to explain alienation from society. He didn't see religion as a solution. That was another form of repression. Mm -hmm. Uh, which people were being imposed upon. Um, okay, so interesting concepts. We would agree with some of those. There's truth in them, right? So let's let's look at how we can apply that to the Bible. Um, and I've got just three concepts which came from him, which I think have got striking resonance. So the first one, sibling rivalry. So that means this competition or animosity 
amongst siblings. Um, it, it could be positive, positive competition, but mostly it's not. And it's driven from a feeling of unfairness. This other person's got more than me. Um, I wonder, can you, can you think of any examples of um, sibling rivalry? <laughs> where, would, where would there be in, in, in Genesis? Cain, Cain and Abel. Abel, yeah, yeah. Esau and Jacob. Jacob Esau and Jacob. Yeah. Any females? Siblings. Uh, Leah and Rachel. Jealousy oh, about course, giving birth. Of course, yeah, they're always sisters, of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So sibling rivalry, absolutely key there. And in fact, you could argue the point of, of Genesis is for um, siblings to overcome their rivalry. And maybe Judah actually succeeds in doing that by the end of the Bible and they can, end of Genesis, excuse me, and they can live together in peace or some sort of mm. peace. Another concept, he, he created regression. So this is a defense mechanism, which kind of makes adults come out to be, to act as children, really. Um, it's a reversion to this earlier stage of development, um, an avoidance of handling these impulses in, a, in a, a more acceptable way. And some people may never have developed beyond that stage. So Cain maybe always stayed a child, you could argue. You're feeling vulnerable and hurt. Um, maybe people throw a tantrum. They get passive aggressive behavior. So again, can you think of any examples of uh, regression in, the, in, in Genesis? We can obviously tell by the picture, but yeah. I don't know how it fits in. Well, what's this picture of? What's he even that? Yeah. yeah. And what happens when they eat the fruit? Adam complained. He said, it wasn't me, it was her. It's exactly. her couple. And what did it she say? It nothing to do with me. It was a servant. Yeah. So yeah. This is childlike, right? This is like, you know, going back. Uh, any other examples? You can think of. You get less points if it looks like a picture, it's a hint. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so brothers, Adam. brothers, maybe Jacob's brothers. I don't know. Ah, yeah. Um, like, I mean, that, that would be an interesting one as well. Yeah, that absolutely. Was rivalry, wasn't it? Yeah. It was, but then they justified it by blaming him. Yeah. For their actions. So you know, Jacob being besotted with Rachel throughout. Mm. I think an example of him just kind of abandoning his relationships with, or abandoning, just treating other people really badly. Mm. His sons, his whatever. And it's just is a very, uh, yeah, regressive behaviour. And then, um, actually, Joseph, when, he, when they come to buy grain, he kind of pushes them around a bit, really. He hides himself. He doesn't... He wants but you, you, can, you can argue that it wasn't just regression. It was the uh, revenge. You could. And, 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 yeah, and, and Jacob was just love. It was the love of his life. I mean, I don't know. Yes. So... Um, I'm disagreeing with forward, not with you, of course. No, 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 you're fine. Revenge is a childlike <laughs> characteristic, you could argue. So no comments on how Putin is acting. Um, uh, but, and also, but it's a type of love. Um, mm. A sort of besotted love, the falling in love, mm. is different from loving someone maturely. So the in Absolutely. love is a childlike thing, yeah. is, a, is, is, yeah. is this sort of regression thing, yeah. No, very well said. <laughs> Um, okay, and the third concept I've got is repression. So that's when you exclude unpleasant feelings, you subdue them in your unconscious, especially in dreams. You're not being honest with yourself. You don't want to admit that you're wrong, you're deluding yourself, you're fantasizing. Um, and again, it was a very progressive, I guess, idea that repression. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, these, these, these planks he put in are really, really crucial. But we, we've got them in our history. So, any examples there you can think of? It is. So, what, what's he repressing here? Yes, of meeting with his brother. Yeah. Uh, for what he Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah. There was. That's why he became a new person and was given a new name. I find that story really fascinating absolutely. from a psychological point of view. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's the really one of the most interesting stories. Yeah, absolutely. So there's some interesting stuff there, which is kind of interesting at the night as well. Maybe this was a dream, so it's coming out and in he that. was on his own. He was on his own, exactly. Any other examples that you can think of of repression? In fact, we couldn't hear part of the... I don't remember with the brothers, just mm -hmm. difficult to think like straight away when, yeah. when they came to face Joseph and Judah standing up. Because I actually think Judah's behaviour at the time really changed uh, Joseph. Absolutely. Then, you know, all those years of... Absolutely. But I don't think that's repression. Why is that repression? I don't know. I don't it's going to it's going to be really because they all they, you know I, I don't think they really kind of acknowledge their guilt until then. Yes, yeah. was, but was he was cathartic. What he did, I think he was. Yeah. Got, repression is kind of keeping something within. Oh, okay. Um, so the, the couple of examples I've got is this dream <laughs> which Joseph had when he was a kid of of the suns and the star stars bowing down to him. He was you know he was obviously thinking he should be top dog and that's uh, something here. And then the Akeda story, wow, there's all sorts of interesting stuff going on there in terms of, um, uh, you, you, you know, what, what really was, was Abraham thinking of? What was he repressing when he was actually going to kill his son? So it's a, a really interesting, uh, yeah, you can interpret it in lots of different ways, but the psychological problems going on there. When we look, read a story these days and we think, gosh, that sounds a bit odd psychologically, then it's one, then that's where this sort of att attribute really comes through. Mm. So lots of psychological concepts that we can see in our, in our text. And in fact, it's astonishing it is so psychological, really. And we can analyze it using another model of Freud's, which is perhaps one of his most famous ones, which is the way that he divided the mind up into the id, superego, and ego. I'm just going to play around with this, if that's okay. So I'll, I'll define the term. So the id, the id is this instinctive forces. You, you immediately react. I think it's your amygdala reacting to something. It's primitive. It's passionate. You, you ju it's what's your source of energy. And it's always unconscious. You're never thinking about it. Those of you who know transactional analysis, this is the child within you acting. So it's your instincts. In contrast to that, you've got your superego. So this is not what you want to do, it's what you should do. This is your parent or your God telling you what to do. Um, what others approve of, let's put down here, your duty. You're conforming to society's expectations. A sort of bossiness. And that would be parent in transactional analysis terms. Um, so I guess the first, um, yeah, the first one, you could argue that it is the Yetzirah, by the way. So this is the bad inclination. And, in with, and it's called something that we need this because we need it to have kids and to make money and so forth. It's also, if you said it is the basic instincts and amygdala, it's, it's fight or, or what is that, fight or flight? Flight, flight or flight, fight yeah. Or fight or flight, so, so it's not always kind of, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm Because it's impulsive, because you'll see that the ego is not thought through one. So bad, we, we use the yates that had, it, we, it's needed. So without it, it's, it's maybe translated, but it's, that is the translation. It's the, the, mm. the, 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 um, if you were all good, you wouldn't do anything. So we need the balance between the two. Um, but we need something controlling it. If it's out of control, it's no good. It's according to Freud. It's according to Freud. That's what I realized myself. We kind of, you and I are trying to challenge it. And I was thinking, poor Jonathan, you know, it's like, that's, that's what Freud is. Freud's concept. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 it's fine. I don't mind being challenged. It's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. Except that the instinct to be good ever without thinking. I mean, not to be good because it's an instinct. Yeah. To be good is a conscious moral act. Oh. It makes you an agent. That's going to be the next one, the ego. We're going to get to that. So this is just the mm. instinctive reaction, mm. really. Yeah, 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 that's and right. Because of your introduction of Freud before then, it's natural to, 
you know, for Freud to think about this bad inclinations within human beings if you yeah. listen to his quotes. Yeah, yeah, so it makes perfect sense, actually. Yeah. So you've got the superego, which is in development of the child's idea of conscience. Um, so it, in your own head, you're thinking, this is what my parents expect me to act. Um, and so the, the, the superego is kind of judging what the id is doing. And it's like, oh, I shouldn't really take all those biscuits now. Um, so it's kind of, this is the, this in many ways is the good inclination because it's telling me what, well, let's hold back from my instinct. It makes us fit in with society. And the ego is the conscious mind which gets this stability between the id and the superego. So it uses memory and perception and learning and tries to minimize anxiety. So this is what, when you think of the self, this is the ego in control of what you're doing. This is what distinguishes us from, from animals. They haven't got the, this, this conscious mind. It would be the adult in, in transactional analysis terms. And Freud uses a metaphor of a horse for the id, with the rider being its ego. And the ego strives to keep the id happy. There's another picture I, I, I saw here, which I think is quite a nice one. So you've got this going in your head. You've got, I want it now being the id, and you can't have it. It's not right. And the ego in the middle trying to do a bit of planning. And arguably, you can use this model to analyze what goes on in characters in the Bible um, and to see what, what's happening. What is their id dominating, their superego? Um, I think that what the characters need to do is make a conscious choice and not let either um, dominate. So let's have a look at how that could work. So we're going to start off with Adam and Eve. And the id for Adam and Eve is this innocent life that they've got before they, they ate from it. It's a childlike, perfect existence. Um, the superego... As soon as they ate, they realized they were naked, they felt embarrassed, and a bit of ego, well, okay, they took responsibility for bringing up their kids after they left Eden. So that might be a way of looking at it. What about Moses? What's an example of his id coming through, his instincts coming through in his life? Killing an Egyptian? Yeah, killing the, the, the Egyptian slave master, or striking the rock out of frustration. Mm. You remember when, when, when he's supposed just to talk to it? What about um, his superego? So it could be... <laughs> yeah, yeah. He just kind of goes along with what God wants. He does his will. Even though he argues, mm. he, he just does it. He does what, what he should do. It's always shoulds in superego. Um, he suppresses the rebellions of other people. He just doesn't give up. He's always a trooper, really. Because he realizes that it doesn't work otherwise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And his ego, well, interesting his ego. Um, he takes responsibility for the Exodus. He actually deals with God's anger. When God comes down after the Ten Commandments, after the uh, given the Ten Commandments and the, the Golden Calf, and, he's, and God says, ah, let me give up with you, with his people. Let me start again with you. No, he manages a situation. Very, very tactful in that way. Mm. So, okay, so how does that work? But if we look at what, what the lessons to learn are from that, I think for both these characters, by the time they die, one of them is dominant. The superego, I don't think Adam and Eve do much, actually, after they leave, leave uh Eden. They're, they're dominated by this feeling of guilt. Mm. They're super eager. They've done something wrong and they can't get over it. And Moses strikes that rock. That's what God tells him. That's the end result for him. So neither of them really end up with their egos um, in control. So the lesson is you kind of die unhappy if your id or your super ego is dominant. And the example of when the Bible I have got time to go through it, where that, of the reverse, the person who manages to make their ego in control 
is in fact the one that the best example I can think of is the one that Tanya mentioned, Judah. I don't know if you know the story of Judah. I'm sure you, you probably do. So Judah initially starts off by joining in with his brothers in imprisoning um, Joseph in the pit. Um, he condemns Tamar, uh, his daughter-in-law, when she um, uh, becomes pregnant. Becomes pregnant. And then when she confronts him and said, it was you that slept with him, she, he, she says, you're, you're more right than I am. So actually admitting that you're wrong mm. um, and being able to go from that, it's, it's a really powerful thing. So he's the only, the best psychologically integrated person using this particular model. Um, of course, an interesting person which uh, we might want to look at is how God works on this model. Oh, you may. Oh, you may, as they say. So how do you see God's id? Do you see God having an id? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Gosh, constant destructions and tantrums and uh, um, threats. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's all sorts of jealousy and emotions and anger, and he's not just an intellect. Um, what about the... Uh, Superego, do you see a superego there? Yeah, when he, when, when he does the right thing after having the emotions spread. Absolutely. Impulses. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's clearly there is a controlling God in the Bible. There's no question about it. We typically have two different words for God, and, this, and Elohim is the word we would use for the God of justice. God gives rules um, and wants it done in a certain way. So God is clearly acting the parent at times. So if we think of this as chair, child, parent, adult, mm. then clearly got the parent. And does God have an ego? Does he succeed in acting as an adult? Um, so Most of the time. Most of the time, yeah. Well, I think I think so. As I said, after his tantrums, he always yeah. given rules. So there is a bit of a, a, a cognitive dissonance. He yeah. gives rules, and then the children break his rules, and then he wants basically to kill them, and then he exactly. changes his mind and to think, okay, look, I have to compromise here. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So the, Dawkins would say that the, the Jewish God is this fickle, abusive pagan god of the id. All the pagan gods have just got an id. So all the Greek gods and all the Roman gods. But no, this God has got an ego. And I see this as coming through through the God of mercy, actually. So mm. working through people, giving free will, helping people wrestle with their conscience. And actually, if you track the way that Genesis works, mm. it starts off with God being driven completely by his id and superego. And at the end, he's kind of yeah. withdrawn. He's letting people have the say. So God learns throughout Genesis with this model. Well, you see, it was worth coming here to realize that we have the best God ever. We do. And how's that reflected? This is, my, this is very intelligent of me, my favorite quote from the Bible. But, so this is from Micah, obviously. And this is kind of a mimicking these three different bits. This is the three different elements coming through with regard to it. So that's God. And I just got one last thing to do before, our, before we'll stop. Because I just think it's so interesting, these concepts, really. And that is you can look at denominations within Judaism using this same model. Maybe the psychology of Jewish denominations. So if you're driven by your own needs, you don't care about anyone, it's just your own impulses, and you want to do whatever you can and get away with it, what sort of denomination within Judaism is that? I can't say that. You can't say that. I don't know you're twisting, and I'm thinking how Pete would, you know, Pete with the the in God, he yeah. thinks the he thinks the um, the childlike approach to religion or thoughts of God are the ultra orthodox. No, 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 I'm not going to say it's them. No, I'm not. I'm, you're saying, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm going to say. But that lot, that's secular anarchy. That's actually, um, it's following your instincts. This is, this, this is not going to lead to a religious concept at all. 
So that's secularism. If you let your id just drive you. Yeah, yeah. It's not Jewish denomination at all, is it? It's just it's just being secular. Well, okay, but lots of Jews, sorry, uh, yeah, lots of Jews would say they're secular, really. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is, but that's not, yeah, it, it's, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so anything goes is not, it can't be Judaism. Um, if you've got uh, the, uh, the, the, the parental side of it, the superego would, would be, what? The orthodox. It would have to be the orthodox because you've got a strict code of what's right and what's wrong and you follow it religiously. That's what we actually <laughs> mean by it. And in fact, there's a good sense to it because these rituals are defense against the temptation. They're a way of, of warding off these negative instincts. They reduce anxiety. But, but if halakha becomes too prescriptive or controlling, it's going to build dependency. It's not going to build adults. It's going to build children. So if you just do what someone else tells you to do, the rabbi on high tells you what to eat and what to do and what to believe, you're not an adult. So arguably, if you've got your ego, if you can decide how you want to live your life and balance these two different aspects, then you've got a much maturer way of looking at things. Um, Progressive. And you could add progressive. that progressive yes, is the yes, way. Yes. But, that, that, but that is a threat, obviously, bringing your ego is a threat to traditional types of religion, which is why they've typically been against this sort of thing. So it's almost a threat to religion in, t in its totality. It's almost human, humanism. Belief in the human, the good of the human being, ultimately to, correct, uh, to create a society that is viable. Yes. So obviously there are strands within Judaism which don't believe in a personal God, so Reconstructionism would be. But I guess what the ego, is, what it's trying to do is balance all these different things. So actually, we're not rejecting it. It's not, it's just mm -hmm. putting it within its context. You need a framework to build on. Exactly. And if it's religion, that's all to the good. E exactly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've just read the book of Esther, haven't we? which has got no mention of God in it, but the Jews are doing good things within that. So, and, the, bad. and bad, and bad. They're killing thousands of people afterwards. Well, unless that was yeah. uh, a joke. I, it's, it was, you need to look at this at the frame of, of the time, you know, because they didn't, sure. didn't have a choice, right? So obviously they probably went out of their way. It's not history, uh, the book of Esther. No, it's, it's not, not, but it's, I think it's... psychology behind it was that they, there was another decree and if people they people attack them, they had a right to uh, to defend themselves, yeah, and to do. Oh. And, and I guess at the time when it was written, the value of value of human life, because it's you know it's it's very problematic text for the progressive Judaism, and and I struggled with that myself. So I've done kind of a lot of reading, a lot of research, and and I, I do believe that you know every text, or I prefer to see each text sort of in a dialogue with the culture, with the time, with the framework yeah. of the time, and then then it makes actually perfect sense. The way, if you read the book of Joshua, Mamma Mia, I don't know what yeah. they've done that, oi. So then the book of Esther is just, is like flowers, you know, on, on, the, on the field in, in comparison with all the violence there. So we actually, we confront it with our modern violence in a very different world. I'm not justifying it by any means. I'm just explaining that the context was very different to, you know, what we believe and value today. Anyway, that's a bit, a bit away from Freud. So, are there any um, questions on... You would have me here next time. <laughs> <laughs> any comments or any questions, either in the room or online, or...? When we did the calm arts, yes. you, you overlaid the, his, his Judaism, or you brought the Jew, Jewishness into it by suggesting whether he knew it or not he was influenced, yeah? Yes. Are you suggesting that the same here with Freud? Yeah. So, although I've, I've really enjoyed this, and you could obviously just discuss that you could overlay psychology onto religion or the yeah. other way around. I'm not convinced that, from what you've told me, I'm no expert on Freud, obviously, I only know what you've just told me, is that Freud was actually influenced by his Judaism. I think, are you not? Okay, so n n the, the, id, the last bits I did is, is speculative, but the, these concepts of repression and sibling rivalry and regression, that's very 
very much, I think, so intimately there. I think that there's a lot within Kabbalah, which is like this, this way inclined. I think Judaism is more psychologically based than any other religion. Sorry, I'm not going to dispute that. I'll be honest. I hope you... Was it you suggesting that Freud knew this, though? No, yeah. Well, he realised well, that. Saying, he so didn't study the Jewish religion. He didn't. If he did, he would, and he was yeah. so obvious, he realised that he was being influenced mm. by religion. So he what didn't. I gained from what you said, it's, it's good to get the parallels. I think it's fantastic to, in fact, give some, some not science, but it gives you some psychological background to understanding religion, but I'm not sure that... So I'm using the same argument this week as I did last week, that he didn't study it like Marx didn't, but he's grandfather was a rabbi for goodness yeah. sake so he would have been at the table and he would have been right. exactly and he would have been used to having characters who weren't heroes you, you know from a christian point of view jesus is is a complete is a god isn't it is can't do anything wrong so you can't have these psychological concepts in mm. in mm. christianity it's either good or bad mm. there's no type of great all our characters have got, yeah. you know, even Full Esther, of complexities, yeah. you know, she's, she's, a good, yeah. she's got some bad sides to her. So, and, and we're just uh, used to some, you know, not, not perfect. Sides not perfect sides. Her. She's not a, a goddess. Let's put it like that. Um, so yeah, I just, and also the spirit of challenge, I think is, is, is that way inclined. So I, I do think the culture this is the same as the, yeah. The, mm. the, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and his father was from a Hasidic background. You know, he gave it up when they moved. But you can't just give up your, you know, you're still going to be imbibed. Bits of it. Yeah, that's right. And I think, why is it that so many Jews were psychologists? It's not just Marx who did all this. It was basically, just, in fact, they were really worried about it. it would be the Jewish science. And it would therefore not take off because it would have been... So that's why they brought Jung in, really, <laughs> to try to be the, the, the token non-Jew in the, <laughs> in the study. Um, and he rejected it all. So, yeah, it's very interesting why... Yeah, why... It's the same with um, film, by the way, in America, why that became a, a very Jewish type of thing. Mm. Because they were used to making stories and so forth in that way. Wasn't wasn't it Bern Bernay? Was it a nephew or a or an in-law of Freud's? Did, did the um, like the marketing was the first one who created like the psychology and advertising? And I'm sure it was really, yeah, could may well have been. No, absolutely was. It was definitely a Bernay. Okay. Look it up afterwards. Great. Okay. Good. Bernays. What extent? To what extent it has had something to do with the overpowering Jewish mothers? I definitely think in, I think there's, um, if you look at all the, not all, virtually all the audacious Jews that I have done, they had the same relationships with their parents. They dismiss their fathers as being shlemiels mostly, <laughs> and useless and not achieving anything and wanting to prove that they were better. And they put their mother on a pedestal and they couldn't do too much for her, regardless of what she was like. Mm, right. um, it doesn't apply to Marx last week, but, but it, a lot of them have done that. So yeah, I think they were getting this love from your mother, this, this the unconditional, mm. did seem to give them the confidence that they were a little hero. So probably very objectionable people, most mm. of them. Nasty to be within the room, but nonetheless, they achieved a lot really. Thanks to their mothers. Thanks to their mothers. Um. <clears throat> so um, our next session is on something completely different. So I've been trying to tackle different subjects. So we've done banking, I suppose. We've done economics. We've done psychology. We're going to be doing art next time. Mm. So this will be nothing, not, not, ex, not intellectually challenging. We're going to be looking at the art of Marc Chagall and what that was all about. The, definitely the, the most, the best, no question about it, the best Jewish painter. Um, uh, and it's just fantastic. And I'll be showing lots of his art and talking through his background. Um, so yeah, hopefully you'll, you'll come along to that session. Yeah, I'm looking, we're all, I'm sure, looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And notwithstanding, because he's come from Belarus, from Vitebsk. Indeed. So. 
Absolutely. And I know his biography really well and I actually led a tour at the Liverpool Tate when there was his, um, uh, one of his biggest exhibitions there. So you'll, you'll have to work really hard to surprise me next time. Hopefully <laughs> next time I will be like, yeah, yeah, I know this all. <laughs> but I'm really looking forward to that one. Great. Thank you so, so much. It was a wonderful session and we all really, really enjoyed it. And so it's a big, big thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming.